This is now lecture eight in our discussion of missions. And my goal today is for us to take all of the information we've discussed, things we've worked through, and I want to bring this back to make it intensely practical. What do you do? How do you actually live out missions? How would you use the concepts that we've talked about in this course to this point to be effective? and to do something in fulfillment of the Great Commission. And to that end, I've got a couple of different topics. This will be a wide ranging lecture in the sense that there are a lot of things for us to talk about here. But I wanna to try to give you an idea of what that looks like overall, just introducing out the topic for today by um, presenting you with the set of topics we'll discuss. And that just looks like this, from the time that you leave across to the time that you arrive. What are some of the things that you ought to be aware of or ways that you can prepare yourself, adjust, and do well? And so here are the topics, or here's kind of the roadmap for our discussion. Moving across from arrival, I want to talk about the concept of cultural distance. What does it mean to, to compare two cultures with one another? What do you do upon arrival? Dealing with adjustment, culture shock, how to learn a language well, team dynamics, how do you work together with a missions team or a group of missionaries that are interacting? And then uh, in conclusion, I just want to talk about missions for all of us, whether you find yourself directly living in another context or not, what can you do right now? So I want to start off then with that topic I mentioned, the concept of cultural distance. And just to explain what I mean by it initially, you remember that way back, we talked about a series of different cultural values and ways that we could compare cultures with one another. We recognized it in multiple different ways. Uh, this was one of the presentations we talked about cultures and how they're configured across the entire map. And we also talked about certain values so that we could put these on a kind of a spectrum. So we might talk about culture in this type of in these type of terms, you know, moving across through various different um, spectrum parameters so that you could talk about a culture along all of those parameters. Even we recognize that if you put all of those parameter parameters together, you end up with something really complex and messy. An individual culture has each one of those values spread out. One of the things I didn't talk about in that phase or that discussion would be the question of how two different cultures compare to one another. So you remember that I represented it something like this with a given culture. Okay, and the given culture has this configuration. But let's recognize if this is your home culture configuration, this is the way you come preset. The culture you've just arrived at has an entirely different arrangement and preset presets. So I might look at each one of these variables, let's say on the blue, and I might discover that the culture I'm working with is on the opposite side. Whereas, let's say on the next variable, they align really closely with me. The next variable, they're on the opposite side. The next sign, the, the next variable, they align closely with me. So cultures can be similar or different on a number of axes. And those axes can be connected to one another or they can work out in really different configurations. And it just depends on what you're dealing with. At one point, as I was working through a, a cultural values class like this, my teacher put up a comparison of the United States and the Philippines. And one of the things that was interesting there was that on certain values, the Philippines and the United States would massively align. So you could go down about half of the values and they would line up in really consistent ways with each other. And then on the other set of values, the Philippines would be opposite, completely opposite to the United States. And this concept then, this concept of cultural distance, is the measure that you make between two individual cultures trying to ask yourself, how different are they really? Two different cultures, and they interact in their own way. How then would one culture on a, 
let's say a scale of one to 10, how different would this culture be from that other culture? So currently I am in Canada. Okay, I grew up in the United States. When I moved to Canada, I did recognize differences. I mean, there are things going on culturally that are different from the United States context. But see, the difference between Uni the United States and Canada, it's really, really close. It's a very, very narrow distance. And you can move further out from that. I'm just going to take the United States as a baseline because that's where I grew up. Just I have to pick one. And you could move outwards and you could say uh, the UK or Australia. And then you could move further and further out and you could start putting in places like the Philippines, Russia, um, Saudi Arabia, China, Japan. And, and you can put a kind of a number on some of this. In fact, one of the studies I've seen made effort to do that very thing. One of the studies was an attempt to, to go down a set of cultural values, summarize out all of those cultural values, attach a number to a given culture and its, its variants from another culture. So how different are they? Put a number on that. And then assign in some attempt at a little bit of an of an objective or measured way how different two cultures are from each other and all of that i just say it, it can be helpful for you and i to take the time to recognize that there is a, a a very much a concept of cultural distance not every culture is as different from the other cultures as a, as another one might be so United States, United States and Canada, similar. United States and Japan, very different, All right? And if you measure those things out, it gives you a sense of how much of a gap you're trying to transcend when you do cross-cultural interaction. I want to attach in two important concepts for how you think about this. And the first is to be aware of deceiving similarity. And just what I mean by this is you can have situations like, let's say, an Australia or the UK, where as you consider a comparison, I'm speaking again with an American baseline, the comparison between the US and Australia, on the surface level, they seem very similar. And they're both part of the Anglosphere, English speaking, even some ethnic and similar historical similarities. Okay, but see, I, I would argue that's probably only on the surface. And if you actually dig in a little bit, you're going to find that there are surprising differences. There are differences that you're not going to anticipate, but they're very real. They're there. And being aware of those or aware of the fact that you might be deceived to assume, well, these two places are the same. I can communicate fine. I recognize a lot of the way things work. Okay. It's the same. It's not the same. And you've got to recognize the challenge of that. It's not the same. Beware of deceiving similarities. And second, I would say it's helpful to be aware if as you learn about yourself, even as you work, let's say, through some of the cultural surveys that I gave you earlier, if you're a person who adjusts quickly and easily to situations, you're, you're probably going to be a person who's a little bit more adept to be able to take on some challenging situations. If you're not excessively flexible, you may discover that you should start with a cultural situation that's a little more proximate. Now, you've got to work through God's calling and direction in your life. You've got to work through all of those layers. And some of this comes down to, you know, we need to grow. So you may just need to grow through a hard situation. So if you're caught in a situation, maybe, where you face some really difficult cross-cultural gaps, working through those things, you find it's really hard to, to, to figure it out. And in the process of working through that, you're tempted to just maybe give up on missions. I would say pause for a second. And recognize that you you might be in a really wide cultural gap and perhaps your experience or your training or your preparation for that maybe wasn't quite up to it. 
And so you could go through, get some additional cross-cultural preparation, extra training, recognizing that this is a hard one, knowing and being conscious of the fact that not every mission situation is the same and that yours is a wide cultural gap, then maybe would give you a little bit of encouragement when you face some of those really hard challenges. That helps me then to move to the next topic I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to give a little bit of a, a little bit of advice for what to do when you arrive. So you've been planning on this event, you've been looking forward to this missions endeavor, now you're here. And there's the excitement of having come to this moment. But yeah, let's recognize along with that, there can be some challenges too. And as the question goes, what to do when you arrive, um, I've got a couple of just pieces of really practical advice that might help you. So it, you're a new arrival in the country and you're trying to figure out how things work. And my overall advice to you just at the start of it would be to enter in very much in the mindset of a learner. Enter on the assumption that you have all the need in the world to be taught and to grow through the process. Observe, watch, learn. Ask questions before you speak. Ask lots of questions. And this was a piece of advice that I got from a veteran miss missionary quite a few years ago, and he had spent um, a couple of decades in a challenging context. And as I was preparing to go, he just said, you know, I regret that I didn't ask more questions. And I've, I've tried to take that lesson from him and use it. And I found it extremely helpful. When you ask questions, you've opened yourself up. You've expressed humility. You've expressed dependence. You've expressed the role of a learner. People like to talk about, well, we'd like to talk about ourselves. We also like to talk about our cultures, our people, our way of life, our way of thinking. Okay, you can get people really engaged really fast if you get them into a conversation, for instance, about, I don't know, dialectic differences. Um, you're talking about this group and that group and that group. Think about how that conversation would go, I'll assume in American context, talking about the different words that people would use in the South from the North, New England, or California. Okay, people get really engaged in some of that. We're interested in ourselves. We're interested in our cultures. We love talking about them. And when you ask a question as a foreigner, as an outsider, you've expressed the humility, the position of a learner enough that the people around you have the opportunity to engage. They, they have the opportunity to help you. People love to help. People love to try to give some little bit of, a little bit of cross-cultural advice to help you know how to do better. They enjoy it and it's to your benefit. So a very strong piece of advice then is just as you go through the entire process, when in doubt, ask questions, ask lots of questions. View the people around you and especially within your church setting, fellow workers within the church, view them as a library of information right in front of you. They'll help you. Rely on other people, rely on their knowledge, learn from them. I've told my children a lot as we go into different situations, and some of them that they're familiar with and some of them that they aren't. Monkey see, monkey do. And I just we just use that as kind of like a, an aphorism, but it works. I mean, the idea being you go in and you don't know what to do. Walk, look around and watch the others. What do they do? What do they reach for? What do they pick up? What are they using? If we're in a table setting situation, um, I've been in situations where I'm eating and I have no idea what the routine is. I have no idea what the expectation is. See, but in a table situ setting situation, it's going to be kind of important that you follow the, the, the right. I mean, it's going to cons be considered rude if you don't do it right. And so what do you do? You just look. Yeah, just move. be the last one to move. Look around, watch, just kind of take it easy, relax, see what they do. And after they've made the move, then you just copy. And now you look like you know what you're doing, even though you absolutely don't. Doubt yourself and, and doubt your intuitions before you doubt theirs. You'll see things that don't make sense to you. You'll see things that tempt you to say, well, to make bad comments like, well, yeah, people don't, people don't have good logic here. People make funny decisions here. It's kooky. 
whatever like that. You'll be tempted to say that. Doubt yourself, not them. This is their home. You're guests in their country. So the person to doubt is you. And sure, I mean, you can learn and eventually maybe you can have thoughts. But in the beginning especially, assume that what they're doing makes sense. Assume that you don't understand. And that's why it's not making sense to you. Doubt yourself and your intuitions before you doubt theirs. Embrace situations with humility. Embrace vulnerability. Embrace awkwardness. Recognize that, you know, there's going to be a lot of social interaction here that's going to feel really weird to you, really cringy to you. There are going to be a lot of failed conversations that kind of start out and then they just freeze. They don't work and it gets awkward. Embrace it. <laughs> if you recognize on the front end that awkward is going to be the, the mode or just the modus operandi, the natural thing that happens, then it's a whole lot easier to take when it happens. Of course, it's going to be awkward. You're a learner. Embrace it. And embrace being kind of reduced to a childlike status. Because that's, again, a major part of the cultural learning process. Welcome correction from people. Don't give correction. You can do that eventually, maybe. But even there, you're going to be careful just for now. Just be ready for correction. Be a listener and be a learner. And I would say, finally, um, as you work through it, let the new situation drive you to understand scripture better. So we have certain routines or scripts, frameworks that we're accustomed to. As we come into various situations, we just assume, well, this is the way it is because everybody around us does it that way. And these could even be down to ethical things. These could be even down to biblical applications, principles that we're applying to life. And so it works. It works in our situation, our context. We all know what we're all thinking and it all works. You get into a new context and you might discover that there are issues, problems, questions, concerns that you've not given sufficient consideration to. I mean biblically. And you may find on some of those questions, let's say polygamy, you've just never worked through it. You've never worked through the question of what defines a marriage. And you come into a new context and there's some ambiguity. Government and how you relate to it. What do you do when government is corrupt? Like, like transparently corrupt. How do you relate to it? You may never have had to work through that. And you may find yourself going back to passages that you never looked at closely and paying attention to details that you never saw. They're there. I mean, God built them into his text. You just never had to use them before. And I would say then, let the new situation drive you to understand scripture better. And let it drive you also to appreciate Christ more. The concept of humility, the concept of dealing with um, difficulty in a new situation, cross-cultural struggles, Christ came from heaven to earth. Could it be part of driving you to appreciate what he did for you? as you struggle through the adjustment yourself. I'd like to move to adjustment and culture shock. This is an interesting topic because a lot of times when people think of cross-cultural adjustment or culture shock, um, what they are thinking of or what they'll tell you is really the first couple of weeks maybe of adjustment. And I'm gonna contend here that that's not at all what we're talking about with culture shock. This is a reasonably helpful graph of kind of the process of cultural adjustment. And there are myriad graphs like this all across the internet, lots of places you can find this kind of concept. Um, but the idea of this is that on the initial arrival, like this point in the process, you're actually at your, your highest enjoyment of cultural difference. <laughs> When you freshly arrive, some people call it the honeymoon period, the tourist phase. I mean, it's exhilarating. You see all the differences and you're fascinated and you want to explore. It's all very exciting stuff. And a lot of times people are viewing that as the experience of culture shock. I mean, admittedly, there is some kind of displacement 
at this point, or there's an experience of uncertainty and confusion in the sense that you look around and you don't understand some different things. But if, if you're viewing culture shock as that sense of displacement that comes in the first couple of weeks in a new place, that's not it. That's definitively not it. That's the highest point. Um, what follows is a, a shock, the, the real shock. And it's the crash of when the place becomes not just a visit, but now this is actually home. This is, this is a place you're not, sorry, getting away from. <laughs> and it, it's the awareness now that the, the, the time scale going forward is not just a limited, a couple of weeks kind of thing, but there, there's no return ticket in your pocket. You're just here and you're just here indefinitely until maybe a couple, a couple of years later, you might think of a visit, but long enough that that can't even be in the mind. And that's where you're going to start feeling homesickness or stress. You're going to have the temptation to make comparisons between home and where you now live. Now think about that. This place has become your home, but you're tempted to compare it to home, home, passport, home. See, and that right there is going to eat at you if you don't figure out how to manage it. And you're going to have a temptation to reject the new culture. I like the description here, a decline in adaptation, meaning maybe at this beginning part of things, you were excited and delighted to try out the new foods. You were delighted to put on the whatever, the clothes that they wear there, try all the new stuff. And the further you go down through this process, this is where you're going to be tempted actually to try to get as much as you can reprise your old life. <laughs> You're going to try to want to get the old familiar stuff. You're going to be tempted to go to the Western restaurants, the places that are familiar. Um, if I can describe this feeling here a little bit better or with a little more detail, I would say something like, for me anyway, one of the greatest challenges, and this is very American, very Western, one of the greatest challenges was just the struggle to get things done. The struggle to be productive and to accomplish results. See, I told you, very Western. But I wanted to be able to achieve and do things. And sometimes the simplest tasks took so long. Or I might try all day and just completely fail. And the moments during that period of feeling like I'm not competent to exist in this setting. I can't do it. That's culture shock. <laughs> That's the, feel, the, the frustration or the, the morass, the malaise of not being able to function. And you're at a disadvantage to the rest of the society. You feel like a child and the rest of the society is able to function and you can't. See, that's frustration. Now, that's followed by the beginning of adjustment. And here they marked initial adjustment. Uh, you recognize that there's some up and down. Think of it like the stock market. I mean, there's good days and there's bad days. And it comes, in my experience, kind of in waves. So maybe a good way to represent it would be you go, make some progress, you crash a little bit. You make some progress, you crash. You make some progress, you crash. And what's happening here slowly is that the place is becoming more routine until eventually you're starting to think of it more as home. Or, said differently, you're starting to accept the reality, with good or bad or whatever it is, as home. And you stop making comparisons. It's not even worth it, right? I mean, why, you know, two friends and compare them to each other? Why compare them? They're just different friends. They're just different. I think that's the way you want to think of this. And if I put that out across a time scale, um, this process right here, to get to the real crash you're probably looking at between, let's say, one to three months until you really crash to the, the hard hitting point. And that crash could come even as late as like six months out. You might really enjoy stuff for a good three to five months. The crash will come. And for you to get to this point where you've really kind of leveled out, plateaued, you're probably looking at, I would guess, minimum maybe two years. So that's the time frame you want to think for culture shock. Don't think, oh yeah, I experienced it. I went on a three-week trip. In the three-week trip, you never really got past here. What we're really talking about is something like a two-year process to come completely across 
the entire thing. And a couple of uh, comments I'd like to make about that. Um, first of all, associate some of your thoughts about culture shock with some of the earlier observations we made about culture in general. You remember I've brought back this graph a couple of times for you. It's the idea that culture has multiple layers, behavior, values, going past values, we get down to beliefs and ultimately down into assumptions. I would associate that concept with three, I'm going to give three layers of culture shock. Surface differences I'm going to associate first with behaviors, the very top, the purple. And the surface differences would be things like food, weather, transportation, finances, just logistical stuff. How do you get stuff done in this society? And that's a challenge. I mean, I express some culture shock frustrations that were directly linked to those kinds of categories. So not to minimize those, but those are the first layer. The second layer I'm going to talk about in a bit and it's not exactly associated with values and beliefs, um, but you can kind of go that direction if you want to think of it in terms of values. Longer term skills that can only be learned across a great deal of time. Here I'm talking about language and human social interaction. That's the stuff that you're probably not going to get up to speed for a year, a year and a half, maybe a couple of years to really get language functioning well enough that you enjoy interaction, that you're comfortable doing it, to get the system that you know how to interact with people and, and know how they're, why they're reacting or responding the way they are and what that means. So I'm calling that layer two on the culture shock process. And then layer three probably would be roughly associated with the assumptions level in my graph here. And I'm just calling this deep values. And what I would argue here on this part of culture shock, I'm not sure that you ever get past it. I mean, some, but I, I would argue that some of this is just permanent and it would be differences in your views, let's say on privacy, you know, how much, how much am I willing to live my life in parallel with someone else right in my home? Concepts of productivity. How much do you value yourself as a human in terms of what you can achieve? Male and female roles, collectivism, individualism. Um, and, and these types of issues are so deep that I, I would expect if you're enculturated in one context, and even if you move to another context and you live there for a matter of years, you probably will never entirely get past some of those. I'll just say, I mean, even you know, as we lived and loved working in the Philippines, it was still just mentally hard for me to get my head around kind of the idea of um, it being in a social situation where there wasn't really anything happening and we're just spending time together, kind of relaxing. The American in me wants to, hey, what's the next thing on the program? And I would work at it. Or concepts of privacy, um, you know, notions or assumptions about how much someone would, let's say, come into your home and that kind of thing. Um, it would just be different. And you kind of never get past those and you recognize it. <laughs> you recognize that it's just, a, it eats at you a little bit and you just know that it's a cultural thing. And so eating at you a little bit is okay. And you say, well, this is what it is. It's going to eat at me. I'm American. I can't get it out of my head. Uh, I won't be able to change myself in this way. And so I just accept it and embrace it. Some suggestions then about how you handle culture shock. Recognize that your culture has goofy things too. In your new setting, you might find some really frustrating stuff. Um, you know, other people would be really frustrated with yours. It's nor Your culture is not all that great either. It's broken in its own way. Second suggestion, lose your identity. Stop caring about your honor. That's a big one. It, embrace the idea that, you know, I'm functionally going to be like a two-year-old in this setting for a little while. I'm going to be ignorant, unaware. I'm going to need to learn and just embrace it. Don't go around trying to defend that. No, really, I am a great guy. Um, you know, let the Lord worry about that. And you just get, get, get your work done. Engage with people. Love people. Live life. Serve God. Let God worry about your honor. That can, that can wait. <laughs> Put that out there for a little while. Hang up your identity. Set it to the side. Ask questions. I said that before, but I'll just put it in here because, well, why not? Let's get it again. 
And I, I would say, finally, the best way for you to cut through the culture shock process or to manage it is to love people. You, you can deal with a lot of frustration and annoyance if you can love the people. In fact, in, in a lot of ways, life in a cross-cultural situation for anybody, anybody, no matter which direction they go and whatever culture moves they make, life is often a matter of enduring the differences of a place for the sake of loving the people. <laughs> I think that's it. Y you won't really exactly fix how you feel about a place and whatever the different differences are. But you can kind of balance it out if you love the people. And that's related then to what is my, my strongest missions advice for any aspect of the cross-cultural process. Your best tool is the fruit of the Spirit. Humility, depending on the people around you, joy in the Lord, dependence on Him, um, waiting and patience and endurance and all of these qualities especially I'll just put humility in again, will help you navigate this. And I can't give you any better advice than that. Walk closely with God, depend on him, be desperate, read his word, love his word, do the next right thing. Sometimes you have to set your feelings or your struggles aside. Sometimes you'll feel mentally or emotionally off and there's no really particularly good reason for it. You're just off. It's culture, it's adjustment. Probably don't stress about it, just Go about what you need to do and wait and trust the Lord that he will eventually give you grace to help. And one of the biggest pieces of that adjustment process is going to be my next topic. So just so that we're kind of tracking where we're going along, we've already discussed a bit the foundational ideas of how you think about cultural distance. We've talked a little bit about what you do when you arrive and adjustment and culture shock. I want to shift now to the next topic, which is how to learn a language well. And I'll give this an introduction um, to the with the question, why even bother learning the language at all? Now, that sounds like a really pointless question, of course. By the time you've gotten this far in a missions course, then you believe in learning the language I trust. You should, because... I've emphasized it. It's a big deal. It's critical. But here's reality. In some places, people will question whether it's all that necessary. I mean, you're going to hear that. No question. And it makes sense that you hear that because mission, or excuse me, English is a powerful language all across the world. People, many of them, would prefer to learn English. It's possible, therefore, in many contexts, particularly um, Commonwealth or previously British colonial empire countries, it's possible to go through your entire ministry just with English. I've known people that live even and minister even in a place like Thailand or Myanmar, and their entire ministry will be carried out through an interpreter. I think that's terrible, <laughs> but it's what it is. And there may be some people who struggled so much with learning the language that that's kind of the only way they're going to be able to do ministry. So you will have people that do ministry and maybe are very effective without having learned the language. But I'm I'm going to I I'm going to argue here that even so you've got to set in your heart a deep commitment conviction level that you are determined to learn the language. You're determined to learn the language, even if there are kind of ways that you could possibly get around the need. And a couple of reasons for that. Um, you'll, as you start studying, you'll work hard. You'll invest energy and exhaust yourself and you won't see results. You'll feel like you're not making any progress. Um, months will go by, many months will go by with no discernible impact on your ministry. And, and if during those times you come away with the conclusion, the feeling that I just can't do this thing and you walk away from it, you're probably walking away right on the edge of turning a corner. If you would continue out all the way through, the benefits will be bigger than you ever imagined. 
Okay, many different ways I can express this. Um, a critical question or foundation for this, we believe as Protestants that the gospel, a message, is critical for salvation. You got to communicate it well. And to do that, communicating it in their language communicates solidarity with them. Okay, I'll look at a couple of passages in just a second, emphasizing how we view ourselves and our identity in terms of language. It communicates love and appreciation for them. A comment that I heard someone say about a missionary once, they said, we know that he loves us because he spent so much time learning our language. What else would motivate him except that he just loves us? And it also is a critical tool for just experiencing what it's like or how it how it feels to be in this mix. I, I think... Um, a, a really great way to think about missions and about language learning is that in this equation or in this communication, I, I'm trying to get information across. Somebody's going to have to carry the additional mental cognitive load of processing the language. Either I communicate in English, which is easy for me, and they on their end have to decode my English, which takes up like, you know, 20, 30 percent of their brain capacity and so they have to be distracted by my English. Either we go that way, or I use 20 to 30% of my brain capacity to code, encode my language into Tagalog or Bemba or Hindi, whatever language is my context. And I encode using that 20 to 30% so that the burden is on me, not them. But somebody has to carry that load. It's either me or them, one or the other, me or them. And I'm arguing here, that a, a biblical theology philosophy of language and missions would say, I'll carry that load. I'm the guest. I came into your country. I'll carry the load. You relax. And you might have to decode my accent or my bad grammar, but I'll at least carry as much of it as I can. And we've already seen some of these concepts in a couple of passages that went this direction. We looked earlier at Acts 21 and 22 where you have this place with the Apostle Paul and he's interacting with people. He's interacting in different languages. And the comment is when he speaks Greek, someone immediately goes, I thought you were someone else. No, I'm a Jew, he says. And when he speaks to the people, he spoke to them in Hebrew. When they heard him speak in Hebrew, they were all the more silent. Okay, using language as a communication tool in order to get two hearts. First Corinthians, or well, excuse me, I'll go to Nehemiah first. Nehemiah is an interesting passage. He's dealing with a problem of mixed marriages and people that are not being faithful to their Jewish identity. And he just comments that they could not speak the language of Ju Judah, but they spoke, spoke according to the language of the other people. This is the old immigrant dilemma. You move to a new place, your kids grow up, and they're not speaking your language. They're speaking the other people's language. And you feel like you lost a piece of your heritage. But it's wrapped up in identity. And what I'm arguing here is that since it's wrapped up so strongly in identity, and since your goal as someone coming into the situation is to identify with them rather than your birth culture, why not learn their language so that you identify with them, their needs, their concerns? It's a powerful tool to use. One more passage that works this way that I'd like to show you is just the concept I gave earlier. Somebody's going to carry the cognitive load. Okay, I've made myself a servant of all that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To the Greeks, I became, uh, to the Gentiles, I became as a Gentile and so on. I became all things to all men that by all means I might save some. And um, it's a different dynamic going on here. It's a Jew-Gentile thing. It's not exactly just strictly a cultural thing. But I think it fits my idea I'll carry the cognitive load, I said, so that the gospel can be communicated across clearly. It's, it's much more than just heart language. It's core to understanding and me taking the load so that they can understand better. So uh, let me give some advice. And here uh, I've got about 10 different things I can run down that I think are helpful for language learning. Number one, be desperate. You've got to be so motivated that it really is part of your whole preoccupation. I would strongly suggest that when you arrive, 
you determine to give the first year or two years to careful, intense language study. I mean, do it as your job. Yeah, you know, you weren't there. There's going to be all kinds of needs. Ah, we need a pastor right now in this place. Yes, but you weren't there last year or the year before. And the country continued functioning without you. It really was okay before you got here. And so in that opportunity, then pour yourself for a solid year, two years, and really get into it and learn the language well. Don't let yourself believe the lie that I can't do this. Oh, I hate hearing. I'm too old to learn a language. Well, if you feel that way, now you are. You're, you're not too old to learn a language. If, if you were put into a desperate situation where you were forced to, you would. They always do. And I've known people that learn languages in their 60s. It can be done. It just don't believe the lie that you can't do this. You can do whatever you ought to do for the sake of the gospel and the glory of God. Christ enabling you. Three, find the right people to work with. I would suggest here that native speakers are not the greatest guides for grammar. What I mean by that is if someone comes to me and says, why do you English speakers invert your, your pronouns and your verbs at the beginning of sentences when you ask a question? I have to stop and go, no, why do we do that? <laughs> and when it's negated, where does the not go? Like when you do an inversion, you know, do you, where do you put the not in there? And I have to stop and think, now, where do we put? And then what about when it has the augment verbs? Like, have you, you have gone to the store. Okay, now let's make it a question. Have you gone to the store? How does that work? And then let's negate it. Have you not gone to the store? Mm, how would we say that? And I have to start thinking, oh, haven't you? You haven't? Have you gone to the, you've gone to the store, haven't you? See, oh, and, 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 you know, I've, I've thought about grammar and language and linguistics my whole life. I've taught Greek. I've done a lot of language study. But see, I start thinking about it as a native English speaker. I don't know what we do. I don't know why we do it. I have no idea. And the idea of I'll just go out on the street corner and I'll ask the local Filipino, why do you do this or that? It's probably not going to work. They know what sounds right, just like I know what sounds right in English, but they don't know why. <laughs> just like I don't know why. The reason it sounds right to me is because mom said it that way, but I have no idea what makes it right and wrong. Find, rather, someone who really has taught the language. Ideally, someone who has been in language teaching long enough that this is like their job. And shop around. I mean, look around and get lessons from multiple people before you select someone. That person and their skill will make all the difference in your ability to learn the language well. Number four, prepare to be humiliated all the time. Language learning is a long experience in self-embarrassment. And my it helps me a little bit mentally if I think, you know, you have kind of like a set number of times, let's say 3,000 times, that you're going to embarrass yourself. Okay. And so the sooner you can have those conversations and just go on and get yourself embarrassed, the quicker it's done. <laughs> the longer you take to embarrass yourself, the more you protect yourself, then the harder it will be. All right, jump in, make mistakes, have conversations, even big conversations, maybe even embarrassing conversations, and just go. And if you make mistakes, oh well, keep on going. Prepare to be humiliated. You will be all the time. But the sooner you can make your 3,000 mistakes, the sooner you're finish it, finished with it. Number five, start using language right from the beginning. Uh, personal anecdote here, we were about a month into language learning. I had not yet studied verbs. And I'm at a church expecting to preach in English. And the pastor, right before I get up, says, Okay, Joel Arnold's here. Joel, a lot of the people here will not understand English. So preach in Tagalog, if you will, please. Okay, come on up. And that was my introduction. And I tried to read the text in Tagalog. I probably knew about 20% of the words and I just read them <laughs> guessing. And then I went through trying to do my best to pick out little pieces of the passage and incorporate them into what I said. It was a mess. It was just a total mess. And it got me going. Because from that point on, I really couldn't, um, I couldn't be fearful about using it. 
And one of the limitations we'll face is if you are trying to, okay, I'll learn the language first, then I'll start going out and using it. You'll never get there. Get out there, use the messy stuff, make the mistakes, embarrass yourself. And in the process, you'll learn. Number six, try stuff. Be playful. I was reading a biography of uh, Benjamin Franklin, and there's a period where Franklin and John Adams are both in France. They're on a diplomatic mission during the war, and their job is to try to learn French. And so they've got about six months to a year to try to learn French to do their diplomatic mission. John Adams uses the really um, disciplined method of getting the books, sitting down, and he sets out a plan, and he's consistent, and he does his lessons every day. And uh, Franklin sits around, plays games, talks to people, has conversations, relaxes. And John Adams writes back to his wife and complains, I think Franklin is wasting money and wasting time. There's a bigger mission here. He's got to get busy and learn this language. Six months to a year go by, and it turns out that Franklin knows more French than Adams. And I recognize there are different language learning styles, and so I want to acknowledge that. But, but I, I do think if your assumption with language is that I'm just going to cram it into my brain like doing math, language is not math. It's social. The sooner you can be willing to embarrass yourself and have the interaction and just have fun, enjoy yourself, try stuff, see what they say. You say something, they laugh at you, you laugh with them. It's like, hey, whatever, I don't know. Help me out. The, the better progress you'll make, which relates to my next point, number seven. If you don't know, just ask. Okay, it was very helpful to me at one point to realize that instead of me figuring out how to say everything, I could just say to them, how would you say this? <laughs> or, I don't know. Uh, here, you say something. Did I say that right? Uh, no, we would say it this way. Great. And, and being willing to just ask relieves the burden because, okay, now you just ask questions and find out. Number eight, it's part of your total life picture. So sometimes we miss this. It's the reality that as you're making language decisions, um, it, it's not just the same, a single person and a married person, a, a, a person with kids, an older person, all of that. You've got to arrange your life to make it work. One of the best things that worked for us was setting up our plans so that we had two kids. In the morning, I would study for three hours while my wife watched the kids. She would study for three hours while I watched the kids. So we switched halfway through and that brought us up to a little bit after lunch. And then the kids went down for a nap. A babysitter came over. We left. We went to language school, two hours at language school, come home, spend a couple hours with the kids, put them to bed, do our study, get ready for the next day. And, and that that system, it was a pattern, but that system was an important part of language learning. It worked because we had to have that system. Arrange your life to make it work. And finally, I would strongly encourage, if you're married, help your wife learn it. One of the biggest reasons that missionaries don't stay is because the man gets into things, he's doing stuff, he's seeing stuff happen, he's having relationships, lots of conversations, it's going great. The wife has nothing. She's at home, she can't communicate, she can't speak with people, and she's left behind. And the result of this is then frustration. And they end up eventually leaving because they can't make it on the field. Don't let that happen. Make sure that your wife is also able to follow you and be part of the language learning process. Our time's running out, but I'm going to just briefly talk about missions relationships or cross-team relationships. And this, of course, is one of the topics that we wanted to talk about here. I would be glad to talk about it further. And if you're interested in this question, I've done a more full-length talk on this topic elsewhere. I'm happy to share that information with you. But I, I would just make a couple of points here. Why is it that cross-cultural missions teams find it so difficult? It seems somehow like people can get along as business partners working in their passport countries, but you put a team on the field working as church planners together, and it just is impossible. They're at each other's throats. Now, passing comment. That has not been my experience. Um, I've had very good teams, and I've loved my teams always. So I'm grateful for the teams God has given me. But why? Why this kind of struggle. And, you know, we could do something like, well, Satan is attacking us. 
yeah, that's probably fair. But I think there's probably a better explanation, and that is, I think there are internal, essential, or core reasons that missions relationships are particularly difficult. You're under the strain of cross-cultural adjustment, maybe even difficult living conditions, and those pressures affect relationships. You're in a position where every member of the team is trying to do their best with um, adjustment and language learning and their, their uh, cultural intelligence and all of that. And they're different. Some people are better at it than others, just kind of naturally. And so you end up with this kind of competitive thing where you're tempted to compare yourself to the other guy and either congratulate yourself or be jealous. In our home cultures, a lot of times we're able to see things the same way because we have a context. And so just kind of like all of the people in the church do it this way. And so you just kind of follow along with them. But when you come into a new cross-cultural situation, you sort of have to reinvent the wheel. And you make these decisions that can be very different from each other because all of you independently reinvented the wheel. And since your conclusions are different, it's a recipe for jealousy. <laughs> and finally, I would say that the heroic model of missions, kind of the missionary biography, the guy who goes out and uh, slashes his way through the jungle or something, creates a situation where if, if you're really that heroic, you're probably impossible to get along with. I mean, it, it, living with a hero like that would just be exhausting. So if I put all of that together then, I think you've got to give extra attention to how to manage these differences in team relationships. Otherwise, you're going to frustrate each other and you're going to end up blowing the, up the team. And what I would argue here, think of team relationships sort of like the metaphor of marriage. The joke on the mission field sometimes is that team relationships are like marriage, just with all the good parts left out. You know, you don't hold their hand, no kissing, no uh, walking together on lovely evenings and sharing your life. Um, you just have to do all the work and you don't have any of the enjoyment of it. And it's like marriage without the fun parts. That's a joke. But yeah, I mean, there's this sort of notion where you are connected to these people and there's no out. You just have to get along. There's not a choice. And that means then you need to openly talk out your differences. I mean, you need to be pretty open and work through it. Like marriage as well, don't sweat the details. If there are lots of things in your life that maybe you might do better than them on. Maybe, you know, you, you, you live in a tiny little house in a poor neighborhood and the other guy lives in a palatial house in the Western neighborhood and pays six times your rent. Okay, you could get jealous or critical. Those are the kinds of details you probably should just set aside. Just don't worry about it. Um, how quickly should you indigenize? You're working with another man and he thinks that you ought to indigenize now. And you're thinking, oh, we need to wait. We're not ready yet. Or how do you handle it when you've got a joint product project and you're all putting money in together towards this project? And then one of the guys is ready to burn through the money and buy, I don't know, a vehicle for the mission or something. You're thinking, that's my money. How do you work through that? And my advice on all of these, don't sweat the details. I mean, there, there might be, in some of these cases, things that really are superior. Like, you might be right. Your view on it may very well be the better view. Let it go. It's not worth it. A better question to ask, I may be right, but is it worth blowing up the team and destroying our project? Because I'm right. And yet, on the other hand, I would say sweat the core. Don't sweat the details. Don't worry about the little things. But on the big things, yes. And here, what I'm talking about is if you are considering joining a team and the differences are just so stark on the level of sanctification issues, basic life beliefs and behaviors, core things that are so different, you're going opposite directions, you're probably not going to be able to make it work. 
And this is an Ecclesiastes 3 kind of thing. There's a time when you should try to work through those. And there's a time when you might have to evaluate and say, I don't think it's going to happen. Better advice. Don't, just like a marriage, don't go in hoping, well, he'll probably change. Assume that the person is static and they won't change and work with that. If it's always just like this, if it never changes, can you continue to work and minister together? That's the question to be asking. And work then on the relationship side of it. A Foundation for Relationships, a lovely book for marriage, When Sinners Say I Do by Dave Harvey. The End of All Relational Issues, The Fruit of the Spirit. You can't do it right if you don't have a good, solid relationship with God, being truly humble, growing in wisdom, being always ready to hear, waiting before you speak, rarely getting angry, which sounds just like James 1, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Work through humbly, patiently, and honor God in the way that you relate to your coworkers. And my last topic is just a brief notion. I want to encourage you with what you can do for missions from anywhere. So our working definition for missions has been transcending cultural, social, geographic barriers so that the gospel can spread to new locations and social groups. I mean, my idea is I'm trying to transcend some kind of barrier and gap so that the gospel would spread to Zambians, Filipinos, Punjabis living in Edmonton. I'm trying to transcend those gaps so that the gospel can get across into another group. And I'd like to then argue that missions is not just dependent on your passport country and your geographic location, right? I mean, we usually think of missions like that. If my passport country is from here and then I go to there, that's missions. And I would argue here instead that missions is better defined as when you transcend those gaps wherever you are, or said differently, it's choosing to live and interact outside of your comfort zone for the sake of the gospel. All right, so here's the group of people I'm comfortable working with. Here's the people I need to work with, and I have to work to transcend that for the sake of the gospel. If I'm then playing that out, The greatest cross-cultural skills you can get, a lot of them are going to be social skills. And they can be carried out not just where you go to another country, but within your context right there. You, You might, wherever you're living, if you're in the town you grew up in, there might be people in your town that you're not comfortable talking to. Missions is talking to those people. Missions is working through the difficulties even though they're a different financial level, educational level, or they just don't like your group, working through it and finding it. And I can't really go through all of the details of this book or its information, but there's a really excellent book I've enjoyed called Conversationally Speaking. It's an excellent guide to culture or conversational skills and um, relational investment. And it gives these 13 points or suggestions on how you can do it. Um, I would say, as part of missions and as part of this course, a good application of the principles we've had in this course, consciously, intentionally, carefully work at your social skills for the sake of missions and the gospel. Work at building relationships. Work at getting to know people that you're uncomfortable with. Work at finding groups that you would not naturally engage with and engage them for the sake of the gospel, and work at doing it like a discipline, that you actually intentionally go and find those uncomfortable settings, and you intentionally work at sharing the gospel across. I could give a number of suggestions, practical suggestions for how to do this, create conversations around interests, read books on a wide variety of things so that you can talk about them. I like to ask a question sometimes, what do you think is the point of life? And that sometimes pulls people into questions or into discussions. I've created a personalized tract, uh, a gospel tract that's kind of rooted in my my picture, my 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 person, my my story. Um, I've created a a a business card, and you can put the gospel on the back of a business card. Um, 
work through and try to create a conversation and go for a single concept when you witness. You don't have to share the entire gospel, but if you can get a single concept in there, that can go far. And just recognize in all of this that God designed you with your skills, your interest, your background, so that there is a certain group of people that you can reach, and only you can do that. Take the opportunity to reach those people for the sake of the gospel and the glory of God. This is missions, transcending cultural, social, economic barriers for the spread of the gospel. It's challenging. It's costly. It's fulfilling. It's entirely worth it. It's beautiful. And for the sake of our God and for the sake of the gospel, may you and I work hard to transcend these barriers, find our way into the people that we might not otherwise engage with, into their lives, into their cultural settings, and see the gospel spread.